Thanks, Jamie. Got it. There we go. All right. Recording in progress. There you go, folks. Um, hey, Jamie, thanks so much for uh, the opportunity to come talk. And it's so cool just as I'm watching people filter in to see some familiar names pop in there. Um, so, man, good to connect with folks. And I um, I met Jamie just we're trying to build agile communities. And I think there's just a big power in being connected. And I see a trend, you know, so often where people start in some kind of a change oriented job, you know, agile coach, scrum master, something like that. And you, you, spend two years banging your head against the wall, you know, trying to get positive change through the org and, and take that next step. And it's just easy to get discouraged along the journey. And, and I'll often see people switch, you know, jobs and they go, oh, the grass is greener. Let me go work at that company. And then you find out, oh man, you know, maybe it's not so much greener. And I, and I find the stuff that really helps out are these kind of discussions, these community discussions to help keep you excited and cruising along all along the way. So great, great to be here. Um, so uh, uh, just a little bit about me um, for, for those that I haven't met yet that are on the, on the meeting. So I've, uh, my name is Danny Preston. I studied industrial engineering in college, did a lot of helping flow value through uh, manufacturing, distribution, all that kind of classic IE world, and, um, and then clicked over and began working in uh, bare delivering software products, uh, projects initially. And, um, and I found like every project really felt the same. You know, you, you start out with three months of bliss, then you hit a couple, you know, bumps along the road as you're starting to develop that. And then it's like the last two months are, you know, hair on fire. Everybody's trying to uh, get stuff done, you know, all the scope by the timeline and all that. And I, and I thought, man, there's got to be a better way. And, and I found Agile around uh, 2007. And that's when the world's just collided for me. All those lean practices and flow-based principles that I had, uh, that I was doing as an industrial engineer, just played super nice in with better delivering value. Um, and so jumped in with Agile and uh, have been doing Agile coach, uh, coaching, Agile um, uh, consulting, that kind of stuff um, since then. And so uh, so that's kind of been, been my deal. Currently, right now, I work at Tastop. Um, so we're a company that delivers value stream management solutions and helps people on their project to product journey. Um, so our founder, uh, Mick Kirsten, wrote the book, uh, Project to Product. And, um, and so we're, we're a company helping to deliver that. So that's my role is really a, a project to product guide, helping companies figure out how better to deliver value uh, to, their, to their customers. So a little bit about me. Um, one thing I would just throw out, especially for those of you that know me, kind of know, know the way I'd love to do these talks, but I, I love it way more when it's a conversation instead of a lecture. So at any point, if you have a question, please jump in. And, um, and we will uh, address that. And again, if it's uh, something we want to parking lot and keep till the end, we can do that. But I'd, I'd much rather have a conversation. So please feel free to jump off mute and, um, and share, share your thoughts. Uh, we'll talk as we go. Um, awesome. So with that, uh, I will make one little course correction. Um, so today I wasn't planning on talking about value stream mapping, but value stream management as a whole. And, and the, those are two very different. Value stream mapping is where you're going to, you know, say, here's how value flows to my organ. You're going to generally draw a picture on a board. Um, I personally find that value stream mapping is interesting for the conversation it creates, but not necessarily that great as far as a deliverable that exists over time. Most value stream maps, you know, it's a workshop that takes, uh, you know, half a day, day, maybe multiple days to create. And then it's generally, you find flaws within about 20 minutes after you hit the save button and call it done. Um, so value stream management is more, how do we actually take an approach and, um, and look at how value is flowing through the org and, and actually, you know, extend to the left and right of development as we're looking at how value flows. So that's, that's a, a little bit of a, um, a correction on the, uh, on the topic there, but the main thing I was wanting to get into is, is why this is an important topic now. And, uh, if you don't know about it, why you should to, to continue to advance your career. I think this is kind of a key topic that you're going to hear come up more and more in the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Um, and it'll be like a, a, the main topic of conversation, you know, beyond Agile in um, probably in three years time. I think you won't hear people talking about Agile as much as they will just be talking about the flow of value. Um, so let me hit the pause button there. Hopefully that meets everyone's uh, goals and all that. Any questions just before we jump in? All right, so let me jump in with a, a quick, do you agree or disagree uh, question here. So Gartner, um, this year, or I guess it was early, uh, earlier this year, um, maybe late last year, but they, they said by 2023, 70% of organizations will use value stream management to improve flow. 
uh, you know, it is a, a hot topic. You'll see this coming up. You know, it, it introduced um, in Scaled Agile Framework years ago. Everybody's got kind of their view about value stream management. Um, do you agree or disagree? Does that sound realistic? 2023, that's, that's like not too far away. Like what, uh, another 18 months away? Uh, not even that. How does that strike you? Well, do we know how many are using it now? You know, I don't right off the top of my head. I think it's closer to 20% would say they are, although if they really are is a question. I guess you could kind of ask, ask yourself, like in my organization, are we doing it now or not? Could we imagine we're doing it by 2023? It seems high. I'd agree. I think it's maybe a little ambitious to think that we'd, we'd see folks kind of jumping in at that, that level of uh, engagement there early on. Um, so, but I, it's, it's an important topic. And I think the reason it comes up is you'll see this. So this was a slide from a, a DES conference, the DevOps conference in uh, 2018. And I thought it was a funny slide, something worth sharing, right? But so much of what we're doing is focused uh, over here on uh, the development side. And, uh, and let me jump back in there. And so uh, a lot of focus on that. I'm gonna get a pen so I can draw, I'm a big drawer. Um, so yeah, we're focused here on, on dev. This is kind of where all the focus is, as you think through, uh, you know, where are we spending time, agile coaching and all that kind of stuff. It's a, a lot of times with people in that part of the org. And so we've gotten to a point where value can be delivered there, you know, small increments of value pretty regularly. And, and we're measuring that kind of stuff in maybe days, weeks, sprints, something like that, but a small duration. But then as you go and you look left, it's like, you know, wow, man, let's, you know, let's start to look at the business case uh, section of the world and how long does that take? And, you know, maybe quarterly, maybe annually or approvals that, you know, a lot of y'all might be involved in budgeting discussions right now as you're looking into planning out uh, the next year. And so if things there move very, very slow, things here tend to move faster. Um, another challenge, you know, is actually getting something released, uh, that downstream um, area there. So, it's important to begin to look left and right of that. And as you start to track some of those metrics, you'll see charts like this emerge. And I just, I'm curious, is this believable for you? Not believable? Is this maybe the world you're living in? Or you're like, oh, I don't know, it's maybe not this big, but where from concept to production, maybe something takes 120 days, uh, three, four months, whatever, right? Um, but then the actual development time is a very small percentage of that, just two, two and a half percent in this particular chart. How does that feel as you, as you think through, you know, all the way your systems from concept to, to actual, you know, getting value in production? Does that feel like a, a reasonable ratio? Is it a little bit slanted one way or the other? Are you able to come off mute and talk? Anyone? I, hopefully, this isn't like a, a webinar. Yeah, we aren't. Uh, we aren't that bad, thankfully. Um, it's <laughs> probably. I mean, it's bad. You know, it's maybe like 20 twenty uh, percent, maybe forty percent, but it's um, it's definitely more outside of dev time than it is inside of uh, development time. <clears throat> I mean, if you include everybody that's part of the development process, so from product down to QA, maybe it's more like. 60% for us is development time and 40% is waiting. Yeah, this, this particular chart is thinking uh, an actual developer typing on a keyboard is where they're getting that percent. It's not necessarily writing the stories and accepting the stories. It's really like, you know, let's get it developed and tested would be that, that slice there. Um, so it's interesting to me just looking at that so much of what our focus is, is making this better but there's a lot of low hanging fruit in this outer circle. So whether this is 80% of the time and that's 20% or, you know, in this case, this is, you know, 95% of the time and that's a smaller, you know, 5%. Um, there's still a lot of low hanging fruit out there. And so I want to, I want to throw up a chart to maybe discuss this a little bit more and dig into it. And hopefully you guys will talk, or this will be a very short, uh, discussion here. But if, if you think about the diffusion of innovation, so this is from Iowa State. Now, hopefully nobody's, there's no Iowa hate, State haters out there. Um, but this is old, old school stuff. 1957 is when it was made. And basically what they're looking at is how new ideas, how innovative products, ideas get uh, diffused through a society. So if you think about it, you know, in 19... 
30, maybe if you had a TV, you were a pretty innovative person, you know, wow, look at me, you know, we've progressed beyond radio era. But then as you, as you get going, that diffuses into society so that by 1960, if you didn't have a TV, you were a kind of a laggard. Or you know, I guess another example would be, uh, you know, having a smartphone, you know, in, in 2005, you were like, oh man, you know, I'm right there, innovative person, look at me, I've got the smartphone. But then by today, if you don't have a smartphone, you're kind of this, you know, weird anomaly, you know, like, oh, man, how do you, how do you get by in life without a smartphone? So does that, does that flow kind of make sense there a little bit, hopefully? Um, so with that, uh, if you, if you think it through, um, we had in 2001, um, Agile at the team level scrum kind of comes along Snowbird, Utah, if you guys have, have heard about that in Agile class somewhere, right? And I would say that today, if you're not doing scrum, Kanban, something like that at the team level in your development world, you are probably a laggard, right? Like those, those folks are clearly know they're behind the times and they need to catch up. Um, but by and large, most of the organizations I talk to, it's not really like, oh, you know, we still think waterfalls great. Like those conversations might, I might've had those in 2010, uh, you know, maybe through 2013, that was kind of the waterfall versus agile thing. But that argument's been won. And most of the groups I talk with now, they're, they are already doing Scrum or Kanban at the team level. Um, so coming out of that, what, what they realized is they got better visibility you're able to actually flow stories through a team. The biggest next, uh, the, the next bottleneck to really come up was around getting that into production. So team level agile, you see that start around 2001. DevOps, you hear that word mentioned in 2009, I think was the first time it was officially coined and, and presented at a conference. Um, and I would contend, you know, from 2009 till today that most organizations are doing something to speed uh, DevOps. They're, you know, working on some automation. They're trying to, to bring that along. Um, hopefully you guys agree. Any disagreeers, I'm happy to, to hear that too. But that's, that's one of those things where it's, you know, this isn't a new innovative concept. Hey, we, you know, we need to try it and see if it really works. It's, it's proven you need to make, a, make an investment in improving your DevOps. It's, it's a thing. You can't ignore it. Um, coming out of that... Yeah, jump on in, please. And one one thing I think is interesting is so Agile has been around for for twenty years, and what well Scrum even longer, and and yet it to me it seems just in the last ten years has it really started to, to catch on. And but even today, companies who say that they're Agile or doing Agile or or are really really still doing scrum but a, 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 or we're still doing waterfall um with scrum teams you know so they're still having sprints but they still have pareto charts uh, and they still have you know the delivery dates they're marching towards and and they're doing a lot of um a lot of advanced planning you know you know quarters year a year at a time and so it you know while while most companies may say they're doing agile. Are they actually doing agile? Is a is a question that I have, and 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 has been my experience that that of the three organizations I've been with so far, um, they all have a long ways to go really to to get there to be truly um, embracing what it means to be agile and and having business agility and and and, and scaling that across the organization. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. So what I what I tend to see a lot, and you, you validate this, let's uh, let's uh, kind of dig in here a little bit more. I see the teams at the team level, right? If you're thinking, you know, that that seven person cross functional team that's delivering small incremental bits of value to production, they they've been through training, they kind of get the way that it should be, right? And if if left to themselves, they would be operating, you know, according to uh, Agile manifesto principles. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as they can control their process, they're espousing those principles. The problem comes with groups outside of them making demands on them. So you get the middle manager who says, hey, you know, I, we're doing Agile now, but I still need your three-year roadmap. Or, um, you know, hey, but yeah, you know, we're doing Agile now, but I still need to know if we're getting all the scope done by quarter three, you know, and you're, you're in quarter one. Um, so it's the, the the dysfunctions are outside of that team. Would you agree, disagree, or am I am I working with a different? I mean, I'm, I'm just basing on my own who I'm working well, with. I, which think, I think you're on the right track. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, I mean, project the project management office. So if you have a PMO office, they're they're still very very tied to the traditional product management approaches. Yet all of the people doing the work are trying to do it do it using some sort of agile framework, at Scrum, Kanban, XP, whatever whatever your flavor is. So, and, and those two don't always mesh the way they're supposed to. And yeah, yeah, a lot of dis dysfunction there. And so, so what you're seeing here on this diffusion of innovation, kind of the where I'm going with that, and the next the next little square to come up is really around scaling that agile into teams of teams. So it's it's basically like we're solving a small problem. We're uncovering where the next bottleneck is. We're going to solve that. So we started out, you know, let's start with team level stuff. The next bottleneck was really around DevOps. And then as you start to flow that well, you realize, wow, bigger organizations are adopting that. Now we need to have a conversation. How do we work in an agile way across many, many teams? Um, that led into the, this next discussion around DevSecOps. I started hearing that term. So scaled agile, that, that was maybe introduced as a term, and I'm not talking about just scaled agile framework, but you know, all of the scaling techniques um, that came to prominence around 2011 and continued to grow from there. DevSecOps, I heard that around 2015, and it's really a result of, hey, you know, we've got, we're finally getting stuff to flow here. We need to get stuff to flow there. Okay, things are flowing there. What's our next problem? Oh, teams of teams. And then we actually need to expand that to more teams. And this, this is, I think that was Jamie talking, although it's, it's hard, hard, hard to see. Hopefully I'll get that right. But um, as we were talking there, that that's really the next step as we start to, to realize, hey, it's not just development, security, and operations that need to work together. We actually all need to work together from uh, you know, figuring out how an idea gets funded all the way to how, how it flows through the many different parts of the organization, you know, marketing and all those kind of groups that need to be a part of it. Uh, to get value, we actually need to look at that entire structure, not just my little narrow development window and start to bring agile principles into that. So I would say kind of that experience of not a lot of people are doing that now fits perfectly because I think it's not a lot of people doing that now. This is kind of an early majority group that's beginning to think that way and they're starting to realize it. So I, I hear that filtering up in conversation here and there more than I did three years ago and more than I did 10 years ago, but not near enough to be pervasive in the industry yet. Does that, does that flow kind of match where, why we're not hearing more of that now? Yeah, I think so. And then if you look into the future and, and, and think, you know, what's the next big conversation that we're going to have that we need to think through beyond value stream management, once we realize where our bottleneck is, we need to start to figure out how to apply those agile principles to other parts of our organization and, you know, help them express that. So, you know, one of the first uh, shoes to fall is, is you start to realize, well, our finance model is not allowing us to pivot and market as much as we want in that it takes us a year to get, get scope founded, get CapEx dollars to develop something. It takes us three months to bring it to market and, and actually have value uh, there. The biggest bottleneck is with that, uh, finance group. And so that's one of those first early areas. So there's a whole um, school of thought now emerging around uh, agile accounting and how we actually fund scope, or uh, we don't fund scope. That's the old model. We fund capacity. We don't fund scope and, um, and how to change that and still, you know, pass audits and all that. There's schools of thought emerging around that and a lot of uh, good insights in there. I'm starting to see some momentum in that direction. But that's really the next big conversation to have. And I'd say people that are actually doing that, like looking at their entire business processes, figuring out where the bottleneck is and bring to bear agile practices and principles into that, they're kind of the early adopters of this. So anyone, again, feel free to disagree, um, but anyone have uh, you know, different ideas, opinions, or, or does that make sense in your world? Do you kind of see that? So given that, I would bet most people on the call, if this chart holds true, normal distribution, most of, most of y'all are probably to the right of this line, you know, somewhere in there, like you've started a, a uh, you're scaling agile, you've got your DevOps, your team level agile stuff working, but then this stuff over here is yet to do and kind of the next big thing to follow. So Gartner's saying, you know, VSM slides over more into the late majority category in the next 24 months, I kind of disagree. I think it'll take a little bit longer than that, but it's certainly the next the next big thing to come. Yeah, I'd say we're definitely somewhere to the right. <laughs> a little far 
a little farther over than I'd like to be. But yeah. yeah, maybe. I mean, and that again, that makes sense. Hopefully, you know, there's very few of you that are over here just like barely trying to get scrum only at the team level. If if you are, it's okay. You can look into the future and see what those next battles are, and maybe learn from the the world before you um, about how to bring that in. And I would say, I know this is kind of international, super excited uh, folks all over the uh, the world are, are dialed in. I think different geographies, these are in different places. So there's parts of the world that I'll go do coaching in and it's all just shifted a couple of years to the left. So, you know, parts, parts of the world I'll talk to, they're just maybe exploring team level agile, DevOps, that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think, I think geography, this chart could look a little different as well. So this is mainly my experience working in the U.S. Uh, that I would base this on, I'm not necessarily applying that to different geographies. I'm curious, anyone dialing in from another part of the world that would agree, disagree with the the, the chart here? Well, Danny, I'm not from another part of the world. I'm in the U.S. as well, but I just wanted to add that uh, within large enterprises, I, I think it can you can see a shift depending on sort of different organizational or business units inside of a really large enterprise, you know, this, this could look different. Yep. Hey, thanks so much for chiming in there. Yeah, I'm from uh, Sweden. And I, um, I agree with the with the chart, uh, Danny, but uh, uh, could you explain uh, how to position lean portfolio management in this uh, diagram? Or is it part of a uh, value stream management, or how would you correlate that? Yeah, I, I think I would put that in one of these two. So, you know, lean portfolio management is how you're actually going to go through and, and, you know, flow those ideas into, you know, what is the next biggest priority? What should we be working on? And then that becomes ready for, for dev. And so I think that I would put that into the VSM category, but maybe some of the tips and tricks to actually make that run better into the the business agility category, the project product category. I think I would put it in there, but could definitely pull a uh, pull a box out separate for that. Great point, bring that. Any anyone else see something on here like a blue box that should be here that's not? I debated momentarily about more boxes or less boxes. Um, could could definitely take it uh, either way. Cool. So so knowing that most of the, the world is probably to the right of this middle line. I want to talk today about value stream management and, and dig into what that is. So it's always safe to start with a, um, a definition here. So I'll just read this out. Value stream management was born of the lean movement to describe the material and information flow to create value. Uh, value stream is a sequence of activities an organization undertakes to deliver on a customer need. So this term is not a new term. It's been around for, for decades in the manufacturing world. Um, you know, lean systems, all that, you're always thinking in terms of value stream management. And when I was an industrial engineer, it was easy to see in a manufacturing sense, you know, here's raw materials coming into the plant, here's finished goods, you know, getting on a truck, leaving the plant. And I could I could walk into the floor and easily see, you know, where is things piling up, what's the what's the key bottleneck, all that. I think the interesting discussion here is it's only been within the past probably 10 years, maybe even less than that, maybe past seven years, that we've begun to apply this term into our software development process. But I think all those principles hold true. So as you're thinking about it, um, this is you know an example of a car manufacturing plant. So you know raw materials coming in, cars going out. Value stream management is really looking at the entire system here understanding where your bottlenecks are and the ability to manage against that. It's, it's not the same thing as your agile lifecycle management tool. So agile lifecycle management tools like Jira, Rally, version one, tools like that, um, they're really showing the status of one of those things you're producing. So, you know, in this case, this diagram is cars and software world, that's stories, features, or epics. Um, so you would go to your agile lifecycle management tool to say, what's the next step? You know, the car, just got the, the bumper put on, the next step is to put the wheels on, you know, we can track that. When will the car be finished approximately, you know, based on how it's burning down? Those are all questions that the, your, your Agile Lifecycle Management Tool answers. answers. Value Stream Management zooms up above that. It's not really concerned about any particular car. It's concerned about all the cars and their flow as you go through. Let me hit the pause button there, let that sink in. So 
agile lifecycle management tools, um, they've been around for decades and I think continue to serve a, a purpose. Value stream management tools are relatively new to the market and I think still very much maturing. Like there's no one there who's climbed the hill and says, you know, we're, we're done, we've conquered it. We've, we've got the perfect value stream management tool. Those are all very uh, new in the industry growing uh, along the way. Cool, and so- Hi, Danny, can I, can I say one thing? Sure, uh, thank you. Um, I, what you just said actually really, really resonated with me because uh, I, I, I work at, currently work at Cisco and uh, one of the, uh, the sort of methodology that we, we have decided to scale is Kanban, right? Now, of course, a lot of people don't know what that is, right? A lot of people have not, they, they're very full fixated on Scrum, which is, I mean, obviously still, I am an advocate for Scrum, right? In the right context. So in trying to scale Kanban, that's one of the things we talk about, right? How do you kick off a successful Kanban team? That's through what we call st the static approach, which is the systems thinking approach to introducing Kanban. So it's all about, like you said, the entire system. It's not about one piece of it. It's the whole thing you have to look at and visualize in order to figure out where the opportunities for improvement are in order to improve the, how, by optimizing that flow, right? From end to end, from entry to exit, that's how you have to, that's how you're going to optimize um, and maximize service delivery value, for instance, for my teams who are all security teams. So uh, definitely what you said is definitely resonating with me uh, as it relates to how to introduce something, some agile principle, some agile methodology framework is through looking at the, looking holistically at the whole system and not at one piece of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's important. I think a lot of people are beginning to come to that conclusion that you've come to previously, you know, you're, you're ahead of the curve on that. Um, so, so love that. And that is, that's the key, right? And here's the challenge. If you're, if you really, if, if you're in there, you know, in, in manufacturing, right? Like one of the first lessons you learn as you're going through your industrial engineering school is if you make an improvement anywhere, that's not the bottleneck, you don't help the overall system. And so in, in software world, you know, it's ultimately, the customer waiting for the, the feature, the thing that we're gonna deliver, right? And they don't care if it's waiting on the paint department or if it's waiting on the wheels to get on the car or if it's waiting on, you know, I don't, you know whatever it is, putting the fluids in the engine. Um, they just know I put in an order for a car and I don't have a car yet. And so if you if you go through and you you just pick out an area and say, man, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really crush it with, you know, putting wheels on the car. Like we're going to make this, you know, like a, a formula one race. And in two seconds, we're going to have four wheels on the car. Every time you actually may create a problem to flow. Like you would end up pushing way too much into that next station and you're going to pile up work too much whip. And they're actually, you'll slow down the entire process because you sped up the wrong part of it. And so value stream management is very much that let's look at the holistic view and we want to improve the bottleneck. I, I think Eugene, Eugene Kim and uh, Phoenix project, um, says if you if you improve any part of the organization that's not the bottleneck, you're not making an improvement on the flow. You've, the only place to make an improvement is on the bottleneck. Um, yeah, looking directly at the constraints. What right. are those constraints? You have to identify those first. Yeah, I agree 100. percent Yep. So that's what that's what really value stream management does for you. It's like zoom out. We're not necessarily concerned about one epic flowing through the system. We're concerned about the flow of all the epics through the system. Where's that constraint? Let's go through, uh, figure out how best to manage that, and then you know move on to the next one as we do as we go through that. Very cool. And so so with that, this is a, a little diagram that may make it a, a little bit more sense, right? Um, but that that value stream management is really the dashboard by which you're going to guide improvement. So just, just an example, um, uh, you know, whenever you go to the doctor, right, they, they make their decisions based on, on data. Like if you go to the doctor and say, hey, you know, I think I'm sick, they don't just write a prescription and say, you know, off you go, you know, here's some, you know, whatever pills for you. They're going to go through and they're going to, uh, you know, take your temperature or, or do you have a fever or not? Take your heart rate. What's your blood pressure right? You know, uh, how does all this work in in uh, together? And they're going to take data, and then they're going to make the right decision based on that data to say, hey, wh where do we need to look at that? And so, with value stream management, you know, human body, you got vital strands. Value stream management, we're mainly using flow metrics uh, to look at that. And so, these are while they're coined by you know Mick Kirsten, the the CEO for the company I work for. These are industry standards. So safe. Um, in the most recent version 5.1 brings flow metrics into that. This, this isn't a task top thing. This is more of an industry standard thing. So we're going to look at how are things flowing through my system? How much is flowing through? 
what's the wait versus non-wait time? Overall, how long does it take from concept to production? What's that overall flow time? How much whip is in my total system? And then what's the kind of work that we're doing? Is it, is it the right kind of work? Are we balancing feature work with tech debt, risk, uh, defects, things like that? Where, where am I actually spending my time? So these metrics become, just like those vital signs in your doctor's office, these become the things that begin to point you towards a treatment plan as you're going about doing your agile, agile coaching, agile transformation, working with your teams. So I just want to walk you through an example of how that might work. And, and you guys here, you know, pretend you're the doctor, right, a, a little bit. And, and let's look at these, these metrics. We're going to look at that and say, man, what, what might be going on with this system? And this will give you a sense of what value stream management is. So in this one, we're tracking employee satisfaction, and we can see over time it's going down. So that's an interesting data point. Um, the velocity, they were climbing, climbing, climbing. You know, this is the number of items that they're releasing uh, to, to production. And it's, it's in June, it starts to go down. Um, the colors here, this is the type of items. So this is feature work. New features is green. Uh, red is your uh, defects. Yellow, which you can't even see there. There's so, so little of it. That's your risk work, you know, security patches, things like that. And then purple is tech debt. So over here, I can see in my flow distribution, um, I've got loads of defects in my system. That's kind of interesting. Um, this is the amount of work started, but not finished. So it's true work in process. And I can see over time that's building up, building up, and it's a continuous trend. It looks like the distribution's pretty steady. Like every new feature I release, I'm, I'm, you know, I have several escape defects that find their way into production. Uh, flow time, how long does it take to get something to production is varying here for features, for other work, maybe not as much. Uh, for risk work, it's uh, very, very short, um, but for feature work, it's cyclical. So that's indica in indicative of large batches flowing through my system, like I'm doing these big releases. Um, you'll see this kind of thing in, in an organization that's doing uh, so, you know, something like a scaled agile framework that's only releasing at the end of a PI. You'll see these big batch uh, releases like that. And then flow efficiency is how much wait time versus work time do I have in my system? Um, so in here, you can see this, uh, this line is one for risk here. If you can see that yellow one that I'm now painting over red, um, but there, it looks like maybe there's some approval processes. So, you know, I'm, I'm really inefficient, I'll, you know, a whole lot of wait time, and then a bunch of approvals come through and then I'm really inefficient, a whole lot of wait time, a bunch of approvals. So zooming back, these are your vital signs. You're, you're the doctor or, you know, whatever. These are the clues on the crime scene. You're Sherlock Holmes. What do you see going on here? So Danny, while we're waiting for answers, we did have one question in the chat. And that was, are these flow metri metrics rebranding of lean as far as lead time efficiency, throughput, and width? Yes. So, the previous slide. Right. So to a degree, there's some similarities, but there's some differences. So the way that you would look at flow time is a little different from cycle time. Flow time is broader. It's from when an idea is first you know, committed to when it's delivered, cycle time is a little, you know, that's something that you typically see in lean. That's going to be a subsection of that. You'll see cycle time more in Kanban. Um, flow time, we're going to zoom that out and look at the system as a whole. So there's, there's some nuances, but some of these do uh, correlate pretty closely to those lean metrics. And Danny, is, is the flow time, are you, is it, do you look at it as lead time or is that even totally different? Yeah, from lead time is is from you know that's that's from when a particular part of the value stream is making a request of the one above it. So lead time, um, you could use that in a very narrow slice of your value stream. Like, what's the lead time for getting an environment stood up that I could do testing on? So it's a it's one of those terms that you can go real down. Flow time is rebranding of that to really mean this is. The, the organization had an idea. They said, we're going to actually execute on that idea to when that idea is done. So it's the, it's the macro of that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, great question. All right, and you're seeing some, com some, some commonalities here, things that where one metric might play into another and you can start to build a picture where, where you might go and say, okay, now I know exactly where I need to coach and what I need to coach on. So I'll pull some out just in, I know it's being recorded and you may not want to give a answer that's considered uh, like that. Yeah, I, yeah, I was like, curious, are, are these, um, so like the one in the bottom middle and the one in the bottom right, are those on the same data and different representations or are, that, are those different sets of data as well? 
um, it's the same set of data and it's different uh, different views on that data. So flow time is how long it takes to get something into production. So in this particular group, oh. they're you know doing relatively good, eleven point eight days on average to get something, you know, an idea into production. Um, flow efficiency is the the non value added you know weight things versus active things. So if a, a flow efficiency would be you're going to be measuring like you know in QA versus waiting for QA things like that. I was just curious. I was just curious because um, you know the flow time is uh, pretty high for that one line um, towards the right of the graph, but then the flow efficiency is pretty consistent for all the lines on the graph on the far right. Right. Uh, yeah. The only one that stood out there was the yellow. So what that's again, and I think that's good. And, and you don't ever look at one of these metrics in isolation. You'll miss the whole story. It's like going to the yeah. doctor and saying, I think I'm sick. And they, you know, take your temperature and that's it. Like they're not going to even check your blood pressure. Um, you would, you would want to gather several metrics together and look at it in conjunction. And so again, that's so it. That, yeah. Oh, sorry. So would that be a situation where like, while like we're being efficient, we're, we're doing the amount of work that's, we're, we're doing the work, like we're working the thing, we're not sitting idle, um, but it's just taking a little longer to get out the door than uh, it did in the previous month. Right. Yes, exactly. And there could be any number of things. So just kind of pulling that thread, right? So there's not a lot of, on that green line specifically, there's not a lot of non-value added weight. I mean, maybe there is, it's 50% efficient. So 50% of the time is, is waiting around for somebody to, to do the next thing. 50% is actively working. So it's plenty of improvements to make on that green line. Um, but as a whole, our, our time is varying wildly. And if you, if you kind of zoom back, like you guys, if, if you remember Little's Law, if you, if you ever studied that, but there's only a certain, so much stuff you can push in a system before it bogs down. Think about rush hour in a, in a big city near where you live. Um, you know, when there's not a lot of traffic on the road, things can flow pretty quickly through it. But if you try to get home during rush hour, it's bogged down. It takes you a lot longer to get there. And that's what this is showing us. This is basically showing us, hey, you know, like rush hour is starting to hit here. Like we're, we're continuing to pile up work. And as a matter of fact, it piled up so bad, I can tell you exactly when we, we finally hit rush hour. We hit that in the month of June. And we, we actually had so much piled up that we began to be able to deliver less. So these are, you know, cars piled up on my interstate leading here into June. We finally got to the breaking point. And now I start to see a traffic jam and cars are, you know, piled up behind that traffic jam. We're delivering less to production. And then I can also look over here and see, well, man, that also has an impact on my employee satisfaction. So people are, are feeling that amount of whip. They're also discouraged we're not getting it to production. And now my employee satisfaction's beginning to fall down. So as a coach, what this does is it starts to arm you with some insights and some tools to go have discussions, you know, beyond your team. So if you're a scrum master, you know, there's always that, that uh, man, you know, banging ahead, my head against the wall with this middle manager who doesn't get whip limits and why it's important to focus and all the advantage of that. Like now you could have data through your value stream management uh, practices to actually show the impact of that on your ability to deliver and say, hey, look, you know, you keep wanting more and more, the more you shove on, the less you get. Let's run an experiment and actually take on less whip and see if we can actually improve this flow velocity. So it's it's really what's happening here is we're getting a, a whole new way to go about transform your organization. So uh, oftentimes you'll hear leaders say, man, you know, it takes so long to get features to market. This is such a such a pain. We need to do agile. And they just jump right into whatever it is, you know, like let's start doing scaled agile or let's, you know, let's go implement, you know, Scrum, DevOps, whatever, right? They jump right into a, a, a particular principle or, or practice, um, or you know, even worse still, a methodology. And it's almost like if you've got an infection, they're giving you a broad-based antibiotic instead of taking a blood culture and figuring out which antibiotic you need. And so the, I think the way that most coaching is gonna be done in the coming years as value stream management takes precedence is we'll actually not jump right to the solution. We're gonna say, hey, we, you know, we think there's a problem of, long time for features taking the market. Let's actually get in, get the metrics and understand what's causing that problem. Let's get to that, figure out what the real bottleneck is. And then let's go bring to bear the right practice or principle to fix that problem, uh, taking a much more pragmatic approach. And then we can actually see with those metrics, you know, with our vital signs, did we make a difference on that or not? So we can take a more pragmatic approach 
to our coaching. And this also creates a pull for coaching instead of trying to force, you know, Ram, you know, whatever it is, uh, pick your favorite methodology. Hey, everyone, we're doing, you know, Nexus. Let's, let's go. Uh, here's, here's, let's go to Nexus training and everybody Nexus that leaves the org scratching their head wondering, you know, well, you know, why are we doing Nexus? What's the deal? Instead of going that approach, we can say, Hey guys, we've got a, we've got a challenge here. We need to, uh, you know, reduce whip so we can increase our, our, our velocity. Now let's go brainstorm. What's the best way to do that? How, who do we need at the table? How are we going to approach this problem? And then let's get fast feedback on are the things we're doing actually impacting that or not. And so you'll create more of a pull for that agile coaching. And that world is, as I'm working with companies that are doing this, you know, the teams are coming back saying, Hey, you know, I see that we've got a problem with this, this flow metric. What can we do? Agile coaching, like you've been around for a while, you know, the principles help us apply those in our context. So it creates this pull and it makes it um, way more sustainable. Did, uh, overall, you guys tracking with me on that and see how it's, it's a little bit easier to fill your role as a change leader. If you've, if you're basing it on something uh, quantitative that matters to the business. Yeah, absolutely. I was a consultant for a while and I would go in oftentimes after others had been there uh, already, you know, we just kind of do a cycle and you would see like, oh yeah, they, they taught us this, right? And, and they're trying to carry on with the practices they were taught, but they have no guiding light to know if what they're doing is actually being effective or not. They're just kind of carrying on with what they were shown before. Um, so yeah, having, developing a kind of value chain intelligence within a business seems like a more valuable investment to start with than just teaching people weighted shortage job first or something like that. Yeah, I, I love weighted shortage job first, but it's there to solve a problem. Like we just don't do it to do it. And that's a great way to kind of limit your whip and say, hey guys, you know, we only have so much capacity, let's limit that and we'll figure out what it needs to be. But unless you realize you have a whip problem, you're never going to get people to actually draw a cut line on Wischief, you know, and, and say, okay, I got it. We can only do 20 features instead of all 50. Um, so I've seen a lot of orgs just jump right into weight shortage job first, but they still are cramming too much whip through their system. Um, so not even the high value things are getting out in a timely fashion because there's just too much in there. Great point. Any other comments on this one? So as, as you're able to demonstrate, you know, hey, software dev may not be where our challenge is. It's in another part of the org. What I'm, what I'm seeing, and this is where that business agility conversation comes in full circle, um, but those principles that started in software development for most organizations, um, still, I think if you go to Wikipedia and you look up agile, you know, it's going to say it's a, a software development methodology, right? Um, but those are actually going to start to permeate and penetrate into other parts of the org. And you'll be able to create a pull for those principles into the, the various parts of the organization. So I think increasingly as value stream management takes hold and people realize this isn't, you know, my, my primary bottleneck in the organization anymore. We need to pull those principles in other parts and create a compelling reason for change through the organization. So that's kind of the next big major uh, discussion that's going on right now. I think increasingly it's really exciting to see that become more of a topic. Five years ago, you know, when I was giving this talk at a, at a conference, it was kind of like, oh, wow, you know, that's aspirational. But today it's more like, okay, yeah, we're, you know, we're doing that and we've had success in, in this area, but challenge that next area. People are actually making progress to this end now. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting to see that. But I, I think without looking at that entire value stream, you know, if, if you're only focused on metrics in this area, you'll never understand your bottlenecks or to the left or right of that. Um, you've got to really zoom back and take that whole, Let's look concept to cash and where those challenges are. Great. So this is the last slide I've got for you. And then we can just, you know, spend some time talking through it. But really what, when you're thinking about why would VSM be another big thing and why would 70% of organizations want to be doing this in, in the next couple of years, um, it really what it gives you is it's going to help you get faster value to the customer. So we're looking across all the whole company. Um, we can get the right value to the customer as we're looking at flow distribution and using other tools. We can pull in there and say, hey, we've got this capacity. Let's get this next most valuable thing. And it reduces that internal friction to bring change to the rest of the org. We can actually create a goal and, and show a challenge and say, hey, you know, we actually need to take action on this metric. Come together, let's reason and see what we can do to, to do that, what each part of us play and how we can contribute together to do that. And then we'll, we're going to pull that change in. We're not going to have it forced on us, but we want to, we're, we're pulling for that change to actually make things better. And then we can measure if it helped it or not.
So that's a, a little bit about value stream management. And again, value stream mapping is a subcomponent on that, uh, but but it's really there to have a conversation. Like, you know, how, how, how is stuff assembled in our assembly plant? Let's talk about that. Um, and it's good to kind of understand what each part does, where their priorities are. But generally, it, you know, really quickly, it's easy enough to um, map that into a tool and start to see things flowing through. So the, the bigger discussion there is value stream management. Awesome. Ho hopefully that was helpful. Um, questions, let's, let's talk it through. Any, any questions you've got, comments, thoughts? Hey, Danny. Oh, uh, go ahead. Oh. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, thanks, Jamie. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, perhaps about, um, I don't know if, if it would be something task top as a, as a platform enables specifically, or maybe just this, this concept of value streams and, and the education around it in an enterprise. Um, I'm curious what you're seeing though, in terms of is this enabling leaders, um, who were typically kind of like you know, watchers, but they don't kind of do the gimbal walk, right? Like they don't quite get to the team level. Um, do you see this concept or, or this platform that Tastop has enabling a little bit more of that kind of behavior in those conversations? Yeah, absolutely. So that little screenshot that we were Sherlock Holmesing there is from the, the tool that I, I personally am, a, am working with. I work with a company that does that. Well, I don't, you know, necessarily implement tools, but I'm helping people figure out what to do with that information. Um, so that's a tool called Tastop Viz. So just yesterday I was sitting down with um, a VP at a major cell phone carrier. Um, they're actually the, the brand I use to stay connected. Um, but she was looking through there and, and there's a scatter plot in that tool that shows where the bottlenecks. So that really is the gimbal walk. And so for that particular group, their biggest uh, issue was waiting to go to production. So the teams were regularly producing, you know, working tested code ready to jump into production. It was queuing up and it was, it was really interesting. She was like, you know, I don't understand why this is a problem. You know, I can imagine an ideal state where code goes to production at the end of every sprint, you know, ours may follow by three sprints. What's the big deal? And I'm like, hold on, you're, you're like this VP and you don't know the ideal state is it goes to pr production, like toggled off at the point the story's done, you know, like that's, that's more where you want to be. Um, and you're waiting three sprints after it was done to send it to production. You don't see that's a problem. Yeah, let's let's gimbal walk that through and let me help educate you on that. Um, so she was very intrigued by that. And, and I think, again, she was very focused on her development org and seeing out like, hey, you know, well, you know, focus on it from a view of a customer. Like you've got something cool you want to put into your app um, and a customer can't use it till it's in there. You know, a developer developed it three weeks ago. It's going to get pushed to, to prod you know, weeks later, like that's all, you know, old knowledge, all that. So it was really insightful. I think the light bulb kind of turned on and was like, oh, okay, I got it. So that it is a whole system. Yeah. Thank you, Danny. I, one other thing on that, that, that I'm seeing, at least in, in my uh, enterprises, we're kind of doing our own version of, of creating a dashboard like that. Um, you know, pulling things in from Azure DevOps, Jira, these kinds of tools, right? And then trying to visualize it with like Tableau or something. But um, currently where I'm trying to coach and help people see is they're not necessarily visualizing it in the way like you just showed where you get that nice, clear distinction of, you know, defect versus um, feature work versus, you know, tech debt or, or risk kind of management things. And, and that's just, it's so simple and yet it's so powerful when you can see that distribution. So um, I appreciate you highlighting that today. It's, it's very helpful. Yeah, yeah, great. Glad, glad I could help out. Other questions, thoughts? So does Tastop uh, support integration with, with all the major players such as ABO, Jira? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So as a as a industry, there's a lot of different folks that would do value stream management. Most of those are plugged in their own ecosystem. Um, and so Tastop is one that is designed like we don't we, we don't sell anything else. You know, we're, we're only building, you know, Viz and the integrations to support that. And so um, so we play with everything like over 60 connectors. And, and I think the biggest competition for Tastop isn't another company. It's the we build our own. That's really kind of the, the whole discussion you have is. How much effort would it take to build our own and support it? How much does it cost to implement TaskTop? Let's do a trade-off there. Um, but it's it, you, part of what I love, again, this isn't meant to be like a TaskTop 
sales pitch, please don't take it as that. But um, but it's not complicated at all to set this up. Like again, that company I was talking to yesterday, just three weeks ago, they started their implementation. They're generating flow metrics today, so it's very very quick to plug into your systems when you've got all those connectors built out, um, and you can start generating metrics real quick. So that's kind of the the depending on you know how 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 much this is important to you, how, how bad you want it, it's very easy to stand up. That's kind of an interesting thing. You, you might think, wow, this is really hard, but it's not, not hard at all. I know a lot of the, the you know, we use ADO, for example, and they, they fall short in terms of metrics. And, and, and so, you know, usually it's helpful to have some other tool on top of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, so ALM tools are great for looking at how the car is flowing through the, the assembly plan. Again, like, you know, VSM tool is not going to do that. And you need that. So, you know, somebody's concerned, what's the status on my feature? When's it going to production, right? Like you got to have that. That's your, the world of ALM tools. VSM tools sit above that. And it's like, hey, we're going to have a different conversation here and talk about how everything's flowing through your system. So I don't want to, I don't want to focus on just one car. I want to focus on where's, where's your key bottleneck and let's fix that. Yep. So a whole different, whole different thing. I don't think you would want, oh. you know, I don't think you're going to see ALM tools do that mainly because ALM tools aren't the whole system. Like if you think it through, right. to look at value, you've got a, you know, whatever, plug into something like a plan view, then you've got your JIRA and then you've probably got service now. Like, you know, even if, even if JIRA had something called flow metrics in it, it would be an incomplete view unless it's integrating upstream and downstream. <clears throat> And that's where the real value is. I mean, it's, it, it would be interesting to plug a VSM tool just on top of Jira. You'll see cool things, challenges between development teams, you know, bottlenecks, things like that. But it's way more compelling to go to the right and left of that. Say, you know, what's what's going on from concept to cash? Where's that bottleneck? If I wanted to do an experiment with uh, VSM, what would be kind of a baby step, like first thing to try to get our feet wet and see uh, how it all works. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So, and I think this kind of may run a little counterintuitive. It's so into like lean startup, like, let me try something. You know, I think I might produce a web page. Let me, let me produce a login first to see if that works. And then I'll, you know, do, you know, one blog post or whatever. And you kind of chunk it down. I think people that take that same approach with VSM think, let me model one team's work and I'll and see if there's value in that. And then I'll expand it from that. The problem is, it's almost like, you know, you want to see the value of a lighthouse and you put it on a pond, you know, like, okay, it, it might help, you know, the pond owner not run his John boat in the bank, but you're missing the point of it if you only put it on a pond. So I would say the, um, the value to test the value of value stream management system is you plug it into a single product line, you know, a single value stream, right, which generally would be a product line. And so that may be depending how you're organized and decentralized and how cross-functional your teams are, you know, that could be a handful of teams, two teams, five teams, you know, something like that would be a minimal place to start. But I, I see a lot of people want to start doing this and they're like, I'll just build it on top of one team. And it's, it kills you. You'll never get the momentum to expand beyond that. Cause everyone's like, well, you know, I, I mean, if you really think about it, your value stream management tool for your team is your storyboard, right? I mean, you could, how things flow in from my team, where's the waste states. And I could see that on a storyboard pretty easy. So I don't need a big fancy visualization on that. If I'm, if I'm a, scrum master with you know a little bit of knowledge about kanban boards i can show you where your challenge is there or hear about it in a retro vsm tools are going to give you that view across teams that's where the real value comes yeah uh, i'm wondering if we were to say only look at uh flow time uh and not any of the other things that, that you discussed like is there is that a, a worthwhile experiment to get into or is it really having the efficiency the velocity the mix of different types of work is that really needed to realize some value from the exercise. Yeah, I mean, just the same, you know, using that doctor analogy, like if all you have is a temperature, that's better than nothing. You know, like I can I can make some inferences based on temperature. It, I get better if I can get your blood pressure too. And if I can understand your height and weight or, you know, whatever, is it increasing, decreasing, all that, that can, the more data, the more better I can refine what I'm actually, the problem I'm solving for. Um, so I'd say it's not a problem to start with something, but the more you can get, the better over time. So sure. yeah, I, I wouldn't discourage that, but I wouldn't say we're going to do an experiment and all we're going to collect is flow distribution and decide based on that, if value stream management is valuable or not, like that would be a, a mistake. I gotcha. Thank you. Yep. Great. Looks like we're at the end of our time. Hey, really appreciate your participation. Great having this discussion. Hopefully it sparks some thoughts and is going to prepare you to 
keep your career relevant in years to come and, and kind of know where to invest some time learning. Yeah, awesome. thank you so much for coming, Danny, and, and yeah. for we really appreciate it. And and thanks to all of you for your engagement and, and participation today. And um, we did record this, so if you want to watch it again, we'll have that live on YouTube in the next few days. Uh, we'll let you know when that's ready. And uh, thanks again, Danny. So appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for the invite. Yep. Thank Everybody you. have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Take care.